Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Louisa Baldwin, my next door neighbor. Some years ago, it was my doleful hap to spend five months as a patient in one of our London hospitals. They were the dreariest months in the whole year, from November to February, when the great city is shorn of its summer attractions and rain, fog, and frost alternately strive for the supremacy so that I did not lose many outdoor pleasures owing to my illness. My life had been an up-and-down hill journey, full of varied experiences. I had traveled much and seen many peoples and countries. I had had wealth and squandered it, and now at length poverty and I were fairly face to face. I had only myself to thank for my reverse of fortune, and I could not complain of the result of my own actions. The boon companions who helped me spend my money forsook me at the approach of adversity, as midges that dance in the sunshine disappear when the sky is overcast. I could not but admire the symmetry and completeness of my misfortunes. Penniless, friendless, and for the first time in my life, at thirty-five years of age, fallen seriously ill. Health, without which I could do nothing and be nothing, was drawn precisely at the time when it was the one thing needful to enable me to retrieve my position. I had wealthy relations, but as I had not cared to know them in my prosperity, I had no claim on them in my adversity, nor any desire to imitate the return of the prodigal son on the baseless presumption that a fatted calf would be killed for me. I remember it struck me as odd when the doctor who visited me in my cheap lodgings gave me an inpatient's ticket for the hospital, whose pleasant lot had been hitherto to bestow, instead of receive favors. But there was no flavor of private charity in the proffered aid. I accepted it as coming from that great impersonal body, the public, toward whom nobody ever felt a burdensome sense of obligation. The principle on which I had always chosen my friends probably made it easier than it would have been to most men of my education to pass twenty weeks on amicable terms with the very mixed specimens of humanity that passed through the hospital ward as my fellow patients. If a man pleased and interested me, that was his letter of recommendation. I enjoyed his society regardless of social distinctions. I thought no more of him if he happened to be a duke, or less if he chanced to be a cabman. Many were the changes I saw during my long stay in the hospital. Some of my fellow patients died, but most recovered and went away, while I remained till the population of the beds had changed repeatedly, and I grew to be the oldest inhabitant and father of the house. Our ward was a long, narrow room with folding doors at each end, a large fireplace in the middle, with four high windows on either side, six beds under each row of windows, and twelve beds along the opposite side of the room, making twenty-four in all. The walls were stained a cheerful blue, and hung with engravings of more or less merit, and garnished here and there with texts and mottos inciting us to be very joyful, or, when that was not possible, to try resignation as a useful workaday substitute. The floor was of polished wood, unrelieved by carpet or rug. The windows opened easily by an arrangement of ropes and pulleys, and ventilators close under the ceiling at the opposite side of the ward ensured a thorough current of air that was necessary to change the atmosphere. But nothing can prevent the peculiar flatness of hospital air. I never lost the consciousness of it, while the smell of carbolic filled me with loathing. It is supposed to overpower other and so-called worse odors than itself, but to me it seemed merely a substituting of one evil for another. The illness that kept me so long in the hospital was a surgical case of great interest to the doctors, and considerable suffering to myself, but gratifying to my invalid's egotism, because it was the only case of the kind in the ward, where nine diseases were apportioned among twenty-four patients. To have one all to oneself out of that limited number conferred a certain distinction upon one. An Anglican sisterhood was in charge of the nursing at the hospital, and splendidly they performed their duties. I think of them still with respect and gratitude. The nurses were strong, capable women, for the most part wonderfully forbearing with ill-tempered and thankless patients. During the time I spent under their care, I gained some insight into the trials and difficulties of a hospital nurse's life. I came to the conclusion that, if I were a woman, I would do it or be anything that was honest, except stewardess on board ship, rather than nurse sick people for a livelihood. It is a marvel to me how anyone used to quiet and privacy in his own home when he is ill ever recovers in a hospital where he has neither one nor the other. But I had such a splendid nervous system that it was only on days of prostration following an operation that I really suffered from living in public, and then I did so acutely. 
In spite of the screen put round my bed to form a make-believe room to myself, in imagination I still saw the seven faces on the pillows to my right hand and four to my left in the long row of beds. I heard every groan, every impatient exclamation of the weary sufferers, and at night I listened with a frightfully exalted sense of hearing to the long-drawn snores of such of them as were happy enough to be able to sleep. The crowd of medical students, who accompanied and thronged about the doctors when they made the round of the wards, was in itself enough to kill a sensitive and nervous patient. They clustered like bees round any especially interesting case, and the more hideous the sights they saw, or the details they listened to, the happier they were, and the more notes they took. I looked at the dignified bearing and fine face of the celebrated operating surgeon to whom they were listening by a patient's bedside, and wonder if he could ever have been an uncouth lad like so many of his pupils. Could those penetrating eyes, full of the fire of genius, ever have winked at a fellow student behind the back of the great doctor of the day some forty years ago? I soon became interested in the routine of hospital life, and in those days when I was fairly well and free from pain, I should never wish to be better entertained than I was in studying my fellow patients. We were a motley crew, surely the oddest four and twenty men that circumstances could have thrown together. The changes in our population were so rapid that a bed had scarcely time to grow cold before it was in possession of a fresh occupant. We were of all ages, shapes, and sizes, and of a variety of nationalities, being, I think, at our most representative when our company consisted of Englishmen, Irishmen, and Scotchmen, with a caloric little Welshman, Germans, a Yankee, a Frenchman, a Swede, a Lasker seaman, a Jew, and a Negro. We also represented many trades, and had many amongst us tailors, policemen, coastermongers, postmen, a butler, cabmen, a gravedigger, a sugar refiner, shoemakers, and an omnibus conductor. We also had some of those mysterious gentlemen of no particular calling or visible means of sustenance who live at the back of everywhere, that a crowd or an accident brings into the street in swarms, as heavy rain brings worms to the surface of the soil. They are always open to an odd job, when it is highly paid for, and not of an arduous nature. They spend their Sunday afternoons demonstrating in the park, clothed in long top coats and woolen comforters, and never without a short pipe and tobacco, which presumably cost money. Where they sleep at night when they are not in the hospital, I have no idea. One of our company, who afforded me much amusement, was a genteel and sensitive young clerk who had it on his mind to explain to me how he came to such a vulgar institution as a public hospital. He was consumed by a haunting dread lest, when he had recovered and returned to his place in the office of Messrs. Scrawley and McNib in Lincoln's Inn, he might be recognized in the street and spoken to by one of his fellow patients, a chimney sweep of too friendly a disposition. His face, sir, would be black in the pursuit of his avocation, and I shouldn't know him but he'd see me a mile off and run after me. And if a man in my position is seen talking to a sweep, I shall be ruined, said my sensitive little clerk. I made a great variety of friends among my fellow patients who stayed long enough to feel some interest in others as the terrible egotism of their own sufferings abated. I parted on excellent terms with a butler who taught me the kind of whistle I must give at the area gate when I called to see him after nightfall. A handsome driver, bidding me goodbye, in the fullness of his heart, offered to take me in his cab down Piccadilly for my first airing after I left the hospital. A thoughtful little German baker with whom I talked metaphysics in accordance with the definition that when a man talks to you in a way that you don't understand, about a thing which he doesn't understand, them's metaphysics, as a parting gift presented me with a list of shops whose bread one could do well to avoid, from the baker's custom of working the sponge with unwashed hands, and I thanked him. A coastermonger acquaintance taught me how, in buying fruit off a barrow in the street, to detect the tricks of the trade. In short, I picked up a great deal of information that, if it was not useful, amused me and afforded me a glimpse into the lives of other men. I had been three months in bed, and was recovering from the effects of an operation, when I became acquainted with a man who interested me more than any other of my fellow patients. I remember the day that he came into the hospital. It was the first week of the new year, and a nurse had congratulated me on the good luck of having had the bed to the right of mine standing empty for two whole days. Its last occupant had been a dull, heavy fellow, absorbed in the contemplation of his own symptoms, and doggedly convinced that he was the head martyr of the universe, unable, perhaps, 
and certainly unwilling, to take part in the courtesies and amenities of invalid life. We did not miss him when he left, and the blank pillow was a pleasanter object to look upon than the furrowed, irritable face and bald head that had lain upon it. It occurred to me how fortunate I should be if the fates should send me an intelligent, sympathetic fellow sufferer in the bed that I had seen so diversely occupied during the last twelve months. The previous night my rest had been troubled, and in the forenoon, between the disturbance of the doctor's visit and the dinner being brought to us, I fell asleep. When I awoke, I was astonished to find that the bed that an hour and a half before had been emptied, occupied by a fresh patient, looking as comfortable and established as though he had been there a week. The newcomer was a tall, swarthy-complexioned man of about thirty years of age. He lay on his back with his eyes closed and his head inclined towards me, so that I had a good look of his very remarkable face. That he was not an Englishman I felt sure, though to what country he belonged I could not tell. He was clean-shaven, as I thought, but afterwards found that no hair grew on his face, and a month without a razor did not darken his lip or chin. His skin was of a yellowish-brown, and his straight black hair that covered his ears and lay on his cheek was cut square across the forehead. The nose was large and prominent, the mouth large, thin-lipped and well-shaped, and the jaw formed a powerful angle from the ear. The length of the face from the eyes to the mouth was greater than is usual, and the finely modeled long hollow of the cheek gave a melancholy and dignified outline to his countenance. I wondered what he should be like when he was awake, and as I watched he opened his dark eyes, large and set wide apart, with a clear and penetrating expression. As I looked in his face, that in spite of its smoothness was essentially masculine, in inexpression a quaint mixture of shrewdness and childlike simplicity, I said to myself, My friend, I cannot offhand assign you any particular country, but I can date your type of face for you. You have no business at all wandering about in the nineteenth century. You ought to never have stirred from the fourteenth, nor emerged from the pages of Frossard, to which you really belong. There was a quiet dignity about the man that forbade me to ask the usual questions that inaugurate a hospital acquaintance, such as, What's your name? Where do you come from? And what's the matter with you? And I waited my time for a favorable opportunity of speaking to him. When the nurse gave me my dinner, I asked her, Who is the man in the next bed? A Frenchman. He was brought here while you were asleep. Good, thought I. Then I shall amuse myself by rubbing up my rusty French with him. Can you tell me his name? No, I can't remember French names, and besides, he has a string of them. Those foreigners always have. I reached pencil and paper from the locker by my side and gave them to the nurse. Just oblige me by copying his name from the card over his bed and bring it to me, will you? She did as she was requested, and returned handing me the paper, on which she had written the names Jean-Marie Thigonic Papirac. Why, the man must have been a Breton, said I repeating the two last names to myself. A Briton? A Frenchman never yet was a Briton, and couldn't be if he tried, said the nurse promptly, her national susceptibilities rubbed the wrong way in an instant through her misapprehension. A Breton, my good woman, a Breton, not a Briton, said I, and a Breton is no more a Frenchman, though he may happen to speak French, than a Welshman is an Englishman, even if he talks English. When did that solemn, dignified, 14th century face ever belonged to a Frenchman, I should like to know, and I wished to argue with my nurse concerning racial differences. But she cut the matter short by turning to the new patient and asking him plainly whether he was a Frenchman or what, for an Englishman in the next bed would not take her word for it. Our stranger, who was sitting up with his bedside table across his knees, waiting for dinner, bowed gravely, first to the nurse, and then to me. I am a Breton, madam, and I come from Roscoff, in the department of Finster, he said, in a low, melancholy voice, speaking with a strong foreign accent, and he added with dignified simplicity, My name is Jean-Marie Thigonic Papriac, but I am everywhere called Jean-Marie. I thought you a Breton from your name, I said. I know your part of Brittany very well. I used to know Finster and Morbihan from beginning to end. I once spent a summer there. Does Monsieur know Bretagne? said my new acquaintance with flashing eyes. Has he been to Morlaix, Landenau, Quimper, Espa de Leon, Carnac, Plowestel? And then followed a torrent of names of places, some on the coast and some inland, just as they rushed into his mind. 
I know them all, my friend, I said, smiling at his eagerness. And when you have eaten your dinner, you shall ask me as many questions as you please and see if I speak the truth. I should not doubt that Monsieur spoke the truth, but it is wonderful, it is wonderful. I noticed that Jean-Marie, as I already called him to myself, devoutly crossed himself on the forehead and the breast before and after he took food. I tried to talk French with him, though not always with lucid results, for he had learned French as a second language and spoke a strange patois, while mine, such as it was, had been acquired in Paris. An acquaintance sprang up rapidly between us, sounded on my knowledge of the scenes of his childhood and the places dearest to him in his manhood, and I grew fond of Jean-Marie, so that my heart sank when I learnt how badly the doctors thought of his case. By degrees, he told me the simple story of his life. Jean-Marie Thagonic Papriac was the son of a poor fisherman and his wife who lived near Roscoff, on the coast of Finster. He and his younger sister Anne, namesake of Laban Duchess, who after four centuries is still spoken of in Brittany as if she had been dead but a generation or so, were the only children, and had been brought up in such poverty and hard work as sounded incredible to my pampered English ears. They never tasted meat. Their food was the coarsest bread, with onions and potatoes, and occasionally on festival days a little fish and milk. They rose at four in the morning to make or mend fishing nets, or to work on the small plot of ground surrounding the hut in which they lived. The father was out fishing every night, and the mother burnt a taper in the window that in calm weather he could see as a glimmering point of light when his boat was tossing on the water far from shore. When he came safely home out of the teeth of the western gales that ravaged that coast, the pious mother took her children to the church to thank the Blessed Virgin for her protection. Once when the husband and father had been miraculously preserved in a storm, they made a votive offering of a model of a fishing boat, which was hung suspended from the roof of the chancel, before the altar of their patron saint, invisible token of the mercy of heaven and the gratitude of man. But there came a fearful night in autumn when a sudden squall of wind struck the little fleet of fishing boats, and in the dismal dawn, when stormy sea and sky seemed torn together in one gray mist, out of the welter of devouring waves, the drowned bodies of brave fishermen were washed ashore and among them was that of Thagonic Propriac, the father of Jean-Marie. The sea is cruel on the coast of Finster, Monsieur. It makes many widows and orphans, and on winter nights we hear it howling like a hungry wolf at the door, but in the summer it is often still and blue as the sky above, and the little islands are like clouds floating on its surface. In the summer, Monsieur, the sea is like the love of the bon Dieu. In the winter it is like his wrath, and we tremble before it. Jean-Marie was to have been a fisherman like his father before him, but the mother, dreading lest the cruel sea should take from her her son as well as her husband, moved a short distance to Paul de Leon, where she found work for herself and little Anne in the fields. Jean-Marie, only ten years old, worked his twelve hours daily as a farm laborer for a trifling pittance, but, as he said, the bon Dieu saw that I wanted for nothing. I had bread, I had health and strength, and as I grew older... I was able to succor my mother and my sister. Jean-Marie saw the bon Dieu in everything. I have never met a man or woman with the same childlike faith. When he was twenty years of age, his mother died, worn out with toil and scanty living. Work as they would, the three of them, they could not earn more than enough to meet each day's recurring want. They could not lay by a sou against sickness or accident, or afford the weary mother a little rest before she died. Shortly after her death, her daughter married a fisherman and went to live on the island of Batsoff, the soil of which is tilled by the women while the men plow the sea. And there she still lives in many childed poverty. How come you to speak English, Jean-Marie? I asked him one day when he was free from pain and able to enjoy conversation. Monsieur, I learned it from an excellent compatriot of yours who lived for many years at Karnak, trying to find out the meaning of the great stones there. Monsieur Smith was like a father to me. I was his servant. I dug his garden and tended his horse and cow, and he taught me to speak his difficult language. For several years I lived with my master. He was not Catholic, Monsieur. Pierre Crossac would have it that he was not even Christian, but the bon Dieu had given him a good heart, and the poor prayed for him. I tried to convert my master, and I assured him of all the miracles that the holy saints still work in Bretagne. But Monsieur Smith would not be convinced. He had a way like so many Englishmen, pardon me, Monsieur, 
but it is not a good way of jesting at holy things. But in his heart I think my master believed, for he let me go all the way to Helgoet when our cow had cast her calf, and was suffering like a Christian, to intercede with St. Herbert for the poor beast. I remember St. Herbert's church perfectly well, I said. He has taken cattle under his special protection, and I saw tufts of the hair of the sick animals laid on his altar by their unfortunate owners, who had come to pray for their recovery. Then Monsieur must have seen the very wisp of hair from our poor cow's tail that I laid on the altar of the holy saint myself, said Jean Marie with animation. It was red, with here and there white hair mixed. Monsieur could not forget it. I was obliged to evade the difficulty by saying that when I visited St. Herbert's church, the altar was so thickly covered with tufts of goats, horses, and cow's hair that Jean Marie's lock must have been hidden beneath them. And did the cow recover? I asked. Monsieur, when I returned from my pilgrimage on the third day, the poor beast was dead. What? When you had walked two whole days to lay a tuft of her hair before St. Herbert? What could the saint have been dreaming of? Monsieur, the holy St. Herbert has two ways of answering prayer for la par bisieux malady. If he judges it best for them to recover, they will get better, but if not, they will die. And as though unwilling to further discuss the saint with an unbeliever, Jean-Marie passed on to other reminiscences. When I was twenty-five years of age, my master took me with him to Paris, the first time that I had left my native Bretagne. But, monsieur, what a thing it was. The people there treated me as if I was a savage. They laughed at me in the street, at my long hair, my wide hat, my excellent bras bras, breeches is your English word for them, monsieur, of the pattern that my forefathers had worn since the days of La Bande d'Achis. They jeered at me when I went to Mass, and their churches were empty. In Bretagne they were crowded with men. My money was stolen from me, and when I politely asked my way in the street, I was directed to the wrong place. The very children used vile words, and the young girl said things to me that a man in Bretagne would blush to think of. One day when we had grown quite intimate, Jean-Marie confided to me the love he had borne for his fellow servant Francois. Monsieur, I have never loved but one woman, my Francois. For five years we ate at the same table, we worked in the same garden, we went to mass together, we prayed together. We were not married because I desired to save a little money first, that my wife might not have to toil as my poor mother had done. Monsieur, I cannot tell you whether my Francois was beautiful or not, but the bon Dieu had given her to me, and I never looked in another woman's face. We were to be married. Monsieur Smith would keep me as his servant, and we were to live in a little cottage near him, and he would have another woman for his cook, though my Francois was still able to help in the housework. Within a fortnight of our intended marriage, our good master fell ill of a fever, and my Francois nursed him, and took it from him and died. They both died, Monsieur, my master and my Francois, and I tried to take the fever from them that I might die too, but the fever had no more power to kill me than fire has to burn the holy saints. And to think, Monsieur, that we might have been man and wife if I had not loved my Francois so well. Monsieur, this rosary is all that I have that belonged to my Francois, for she was as poor as the Blessed Virgin herself. And Jean-Marie stretched his long, thin arm toward me and laid on the locker by my bedside a cheap rosary made of a string of small berries with a crucifix attached to it. After the death of his master and Francois, Jean-Marie returned to the neighborhood of Roscoff and worked under a well-to-do farmer who grew great quantities of the onions for which that part of Finster is renowned. He was an enterprising man and anxious to find the best market for his produce. Jean-Marie served him faithfully and intelligently, and when he had been with him for three years, he increased his wages, and as he spoke English, he sent him to London to negotiate for the sale of his onions with English dealers. I was astounded to find how astute my 14th century friend was in business matters. He made bargains profitable to his employer and to himself, and Monsieur Plumel was highly satisfied with the honesty and ability of his agent. Now, on his third journey to England, Jean-Marie was smitten with a mortal illness and would never return to his native land. I have been ill for more than a year, Monsieur. I know it by the pain I have suffered. But it does not matter. It is over now. I have finished my work. The day before I came into this hospital, I sent to Monsieur Plumel every sow I had made for him, and a draft for three hundred francs that I had saved from my poor sister and her children. 
I have come here to die, he said, in quiet, unemotional tones, as if he were speaking of a stranger. I listened in silence, for I knew what the doctors thought of his case, that nothing could be done to cure, but only palliate the disease. Never had there been a more patient sufferer in the hospital. In spite of his medieval superstition, Jean-Marie was a most courageous Christian and put us all to shame. When he was sufficiently free from pain to speak, it was with a general courtesy, and no word of complaint or impatience ever escaped his lips. He was always ready to listen to the egoistic grumblings of his fellow patients, though he tried, by example and precept, to lift us out of the narrow groove of self-centered suffering. One day I saw that he was enduring agony. His dark face was livid, and when he could speak, he said quietly, Monsieur, these pains are pinpricks compared with those the Blessed Redeemer suffered for us. That night Jean-Marie was very ill, and I lay awake, partly from sympathy with him, partly because his restlessness made it difficult for me to sleep, as he muttered and talked to himself without ceasing. The nurse was in constant attendance upon him, and she said to me, His sleeping draught has not suited him tonight. He is terribly restless. Between two and three o'clock in the morning, I thought that she was again leaning over Jean-Marie. On the opposite side of his bed, facing me, a woman stood wearing a white cap, but not such as our nurses wore, and she was bending over Jean-Marie as if she would kiss him. Then she knelt, holding his hand in hers, and the light in the ward was sufficient for me to see that she wore the costume of a Brittany peasant, with the colored cotton kerchief on the shoulders, tucked into the bib of the black apron in front. I raised myself in bed, and a nurse, who was sitting by the fire, came to me at once. Do you want anything? she asked. Yes, who is that woman? And I pointed to the figure still standing by Jean-Marie. What woman? she said, looking in the direction I indicated. That Brittany peasant woman to be sure by Jean-Marie's bedside, talking to him and holding his hand. You have been dreaming, said the nurse. There is no one there. Lie down and try to go to sleep, though I dare say that poor fellow makes it hard for you to rest. I had not been dreaming, though Jean-Marie had, for afterwards he awoke with a little sigh, as if he were sorry to return to consciousness, and said in his quiet tones, Monsieur, the bon Dieu has been very good to me. He has sent my Francois to me in a dream, and I have seen her and held her hand in mine. I am only to suffer three days more, for on Sunday morning at two o'clock my Francois is to fetch me. And he laughed to himself, a little laugh of incomparable happiness, and soon afterwards became again delirious. All Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, my friend grew steadily worse, though the doctors did not anticipate an immediate end of his sufferings. His mind wandered the whole time, and he talked to himself incessantly in Breton. When occasionally he dropped into French, and I understood what he said, he was imagining he was a child again, playing on the sands, or sitting on the rocks with his little sister, mending their father's fishing nets. I grew feverish with excitement and anticipation of what would happen to Jean-Marie. I had certainly seen his Francois, and I dreaded her return, but I did not dare confide in either doctor or nurse. My strange experience could only be regarded by them as a sick man's fancy, but my state of nervous excitement was duly noticed and commented on by one of the house surgeons, a pleasant young man who had shown me much kindness. "'What in the world are you exciting yourself about?' he asked me on the Saturday afternoon. You haven't had a pulse like this since your first operation, and you've nothing of the kind in anticipation to account for it now. But I could not tell him the truth, because from me it would appear incredible. I said that I had slept badly for several nights past, and that might account for my not being so well as usual. And I wound up with the apparently inconsequent request, Do come and see Jean-Marie at two o'clock in the morning, doctor. I spoke so earnestly that the surgeon ceased tapping his palm with the stethoscope he held in his right hand. I shall be in the ward at four o'clock under any circumstances, so that unless you have a very good reason for asking me to see him earlier, your request is absurd. If I could do the poor fellow any good by seeing him, then it would be another thing, and I'm almost run off my legs as it is. But I have a perfectly valid reason for asking you to see Jean-Marie precisely at that hour, I urged. I cannot tell you now what it is, but I will do so afterwards, if only you will come. He felt my pulse again, and I knew that he thought I was wandering in my mind. Well, well, he said, good-humoredly, if I can wake myself up at that hour, two o'clock, I think you said, I'll run in and have a look at Jean-Marie. About eleven o'clock, 
when the lights were turned low and all was quiet for the night, Jean-Marie's mind for a short time became clear and tranquil. He was like a man about to set forth on a delightful journey to some place and friends he longed to see. He was full of deep, happy excitement. When the nurse asked him if he wanted anything, his answer was always the same. Mon ami, my wanting days are over. I have everything. Then he spoke to me. I am ready to go when my Francois fetches me. Monsieur, if I may leave to you my rosary, I shall be glad. It may be that the bon Dieu will lead you by it to become Catholic. And he looked wistful. Jean-Marie, I will become anything that would give me your peace and courage, I said. But I do not think that he heard my reply, for he was again wandering, talking to himself and singing snatches of old Breton songs that were not unlike Gregorian tones. I wish that French fellow would be quiet and let me go to sleep, whimpered a fretful voice from my left-hand neighbor. It is the last night that he will disturb you. Have a little patience, I said. Midnight had long passed, and in due course I heard the church clocks for a mile round strike one, like irregular file firing. I had not long to wait before I should know whether Jean-Marie's prophetic dream was true or not. In the exalted state of my senses, every sound in the ward, every footfall of the nurses, seemed unnaturally loud as I lay watching in the subdued light the old-world features of Jean-Marie. He was lying on his back with closed eyes, his long brown fingers telling his beads and his lips moving rapidly. Just then a nurse approached his bedside with a dose of medicine so nauseous that the smell of it as it wafted by made me feel ill. Must you disturb him to give him that vile stuff, I asked, as I looked with compassion on Jean-Marie, tranquil for the first time in many hours. Doctor's orders, she replied briefly, and raised the patient's head to put the glass to his lips. He opened his eyes, and I saw by his expression that his soul revolted at the loathsome draught. Then, with the meekness of a little child, he drained it to the dregs. It was a few minutes to two o'clock, and I was strung up with an almost intolerable pitch of excitement. When a cinder fell from the grate, it sounded like thunder, and I started and trembled. Jean-Marie had fallen into a restless sleep, but he no longer muttered and talked to himself. I could hardly believe my eyes, though I firmly expected what I saw. By the side of Jean-Marie's bed stood the same form I had seen three nights ago, the Brittany peasant woman. Her plain, swarthy face was covered with the sweetest smiles, and she leaned her dark head in its snowy cap over Jean-Marie till her cheek almost touched his. My heart beat to suffocation, and I leaned upon my elbow, determined to watch closely. It was seldom that everyone was asleep in the ward at the same time, and the sister in charge and the nurses were certainly awake. Did no one but myself see the tall figure by Jean-Marie's bed? It must have been a full ten minutes that I saw the woman both standing and leaning over him in her quaint dress, and at length she knelt by his side, and I heard him say in a low voice of ecstasy, Oh, ma Francois, ma Francois, as he sighed away his last breath. Nurse, nurse, I cried, Jean-Marie is dying, and she hastened to him in a moment, as she did so unconsciously passing through the shadowy form that still hovered over him. Just then the door at the end of the ward opened, and the house surgeon entered. What is the matter? he said, as he saw me out of bed and the nurse feeling Jean-Marie's pulse. Jean-Marie is dead, very suddenly. I only gave him his draught half an hour ago, said the nurse. Then I told the doctor as collectedly as I could what I had seen on Thursday night, and how Jean-Marie had told me of his dream, which I had seen fulfilled, and of the ghostly figure of the Breton peasant woman, but had but that moment faded from my sight. I dared not tell him the night before, but now that there was confirmation of it, he must see for himself that it was true, and I pointed to poor Jean-Marie's corpse. He listened with the greatest attention. If it had been any other patient that told me such a thing, he said at length, I should have known that he was delirious, and have ordered ice to his head, and I don't say but that it mightn't have been a good thing for even you. Still, when an educated man like yourself is convinced that he has been brought face to face with the supernatural, he is entitled to a hearing. It is strange, very strange. Jean-Marie was a remarkable man. I have never met a patient like him. There is only one thing that I can be sure of in this whole affair, and that is that I must have you out of this ward first thing in the morning, or your nerves will be shattered in addition to your other troubles. The body of my poor friend was removed before any of the patients were aware that a death had occurred. In a few hours I found myself in another ward of the hospital, surrounded by fresh faces, and I could hardly be certain whether or not I had dreamed the strange story of Jean-Marie Thagonic Propriac. The End